What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Saturdays in the SEC, episode 92. We're here to recap week four. Um, you know, we talked about going into the weekend, how this was really a historic weekend. We had six ranked-on-ranked matchups for the first time since 2015, so um, had a lot of great action, um, some some really good SEC games on the schedule and, and nationally, so it was all in all a really fun, you know, weekend of college football and as we mentioned last week, kind of getting into the, you know, the heart of the schedule, the meat of the the conference schedule, if you will, and, and getting into that, you know, about to flip the calendar to October here. It, it's crazy how fast the season kind of gets by us once it gets going. So, um, but we're going to jump right into week four recaps and start out with the 11 o'clock game in College Station, Auburn and Texas A&M. Uh, Card, I'm just going to give the floor to you. Just kind of give me your thoughts on, on what you saw there. Uh, I saw great defensive play from Auburn again for the fourth week in a row. They're, they're carrying the team, and I saw one of the worst offensive performances I've seen the Auburn Tigers have since probably 2012. I mean, this was absolutely brutal. I believe Auburn was sacked eight times. I mean, hats off to the Texas A&M defense. Their defensive front was all over Peyton Thorne. They were all over Robbie, all over Holden. Whoever was back there had zero chance. Auburn was able to run the ball a little bit. A little bit better than I expected them to, but, man, Peyton missed so many wide-open receivers early on the first two, three drives. I mean, he was missing guys by, you know, 10, 15 yards. The passes weren't even competitive. Guys were wide open. Passes weren't even competitive. Had a wheel route down the left side, completely missed. I believe it was Jay Fair. Missed him. It went a wide-open touchdown. Uh, The defense outscored the offense, which is absolutely pathetic. Uh, Jimbo Fisher tried to make a tackle I thought was hilarious you know out there on the field I'm like, what are we doing here but man the the run game was better than, than I than I thought ran for 144 yards I mean and that's including the the sacks being taken off so uh, Jarquez had 53 yards and Brian Batty had 40 or 59 yards so uh, they they were able to, to get a run game going a little bit but man they could not pass the ball first two maybe three drives were three and outs uh, third quarter, Auburn had two yards to um, Texas A&M's 149 or something like that. I mean, it was abysmal when you when it came to the offensive side of the football. Now, I'll say this: I, I, I back when we went did our previews, our season previews, I said Auburn was going to lose this game. I thought Auburn was going to lose this game. I said last week that Auburn was probably going to lose this game. I I wasn't upset at the fact that Auburn lost. I was upset at how they lost. I did not think in 10 million years that Auburn was going to look this bad uh, in the game against Texas A&M. Again, hats off to Texas A&M, especially after halftime they came out and, and <coughs> excuse me, and they lit it up. Connor Wigman or Connor, we've actually been saying his name wrong. It's Connor Wigman and, and sorry, sorry to that guy, but Connor Wigman got hurt, uh, took, took a low blow but to, by Jalen Simpson in the end zone on one of his passes and kind of tweaked his ankle and said it was hollering in pain in the injury tent. And then Max Johnson comes out and is a absolute showstopper in the second half, tossing balls around, two tutties. Probably one of the most beautiful passes I've ever seen uh, in his second touchdown of the game when he threaded it through two defenders and uh, the receiver was able to hold on to the ball, getting a, a late hit there right as he caught it. I mean, that was just a great play by them. But Max Johnson may be uh, – he may be the starter now. I'm, I'm just saying, the dude played out of his mind. Um, Auburn's defense, man, it's just same old story. They're on the field too much. They, they play great. But once you're on the field over and over and over again, you keep going three and outs, you got no time to rest, you're going to get worn down eventually. Not a whole lot of uh, – a lot of depth to, to keep rotating in there. So the guys are getting worn out. Donovan Coffin went down three times during the game. So, I mean, it's just – it was very, very frustrating to watch offensively as an Auburn fan. Uh, but Texas A&M, I mean, they played pretty good. They had some mishaps. The first half was really good. Um, I believe that the the score at the end of the first half, um, it was it was six to three. So, you, you know, going into halftime playing as bad as Auburn was playing, you're like, oh, well, Auburn's still in it. Uh, let's see what they can do in the second half. And then the second half, they just got absolutely beat to death. Um, there was two touchdowns. Auburn missed two touchdowns, uh, passing touchdowns. When Robbie came in, he, he had one late in the game. I believe it was the end of the third quarter, early in the fourth quarter. He had chain hooks. It might have been later in the fourth quarter, actually. But he had chain hooks down the right side. 
DB on the inside, and he throws it on the inside, and Shane Hooks tries to make a play, but ends up dropping it. I think he should have caught the ball, but still, why are we not throwing it on the back shoulder, you know, towards the, the corner of the end zone and have a better chance of making a play? I just thought, all in all, the quarterback play was one of the worst I've seen. Again, offensive line's got to get better. They had guys on them all night, but they were taking sacks. They shouldn't be taking, throw the ball away, you know, but it was – it's one of the ugliest games I've seen for Auburn in quite some time. What What was your thoughts uh, watching it early on uh, that that day? Yeah, like you said, I mean the offensive line, you know, didn't hold up very well. Just they constantly got pressure, but kind of as you mentioned at the beginning, that there were some throws there to be had that were just missed. You know, like plays that that would have been either touchdowns or, or large gains to get down in Texas A and M territory. Thought Peyton Thorne was a little gassed up, I guess you could say, in in the beginning. Just I think trying to maybe do a little too much, maybe a little, maybe a little too over anxious. I guess you could say you see that all the time from quarterbacks where uh, they, you know, they look, the ball sails on them a little bit. So, um, but yeah, obviously the O line was a problem, but you know there were some throws to be had that just weren't made, weren't even um, competitive. <laughs> yeah, so. You know, and I saw some tweets kind of during and after the game that it kind of sums up Auburn's situation. We've talked about how good of a job Hugh Freeze has done, you know, Mm -hmm. through the transfer portal, kind of remaking this roster. But it just goes to show you, though, you can't replace, you know. I mean, Auburn basically didn't recruit at all, at least well, for two years. And, I mean, that's how their team looks. You know, even though they've done a good job of, you know, trying to speed it up as much as they can through the portal, but you can only do so much, you know what I mean? And it's still early in the season. These guys are trying to gel together. And so, you know, it, the the horse and experience just really just set them back two years through recruiting. And it's, it's just going to take – it's yeah, it's just going to take time to make that up. So, um, they just look like a roster that's behind. And they are, like, they're not – their roster is not on the same level as Texas A&M. Like, you know, if Texas A&M plays out their capable, well, that's what should happen because mm-hmm. they've, you know, they've been recruited well, um, and that they have great talent. And I thought, I thought Auburn's offensive line would do. A, I mean, I obviously really respect A&M's front, but kind of after seeing what Miami did to them, and not that Auburn was going to do what Tyler Van Dyke did, but I, right. I did think there were some plays to be made and and there was early on especially that that could have been made so you know I I did like you expected more I didn't necessarily expect them to win the game but I I thought um like you said their defense you know played really really well kept them in it for as long as they could and and they were still technically in it I mean they lost by you know 17 so a couple scores but um yeah they just couldn't ever get anything offensively like you said they ran the ball you know effectively at times but um you kind of mentioned to the quarterbacks uh, you know thorn early in the game i thought they had a chance to really gain momentum he took a couple sacks he could have got rid of the ball and knocked him out of field goal range Twice, um, back-to-back drives yeah back-to-back drives that hurt them so um i'm kind of curious though to see what they do with the quarterback situation because i know robbie got some playing time holden got some playing time so how, how do you think they're going to kind of manage that going into this Georgia game? It's definitely up in the air for sure. Uh, I think it's more up in the air than it was in the springtime. Uh, Peyton, man, I mean, this was his chance to prove that he was the guy, and he did nothing, not even close to that. Uh, I think Robbie played the best out of all of them. Now, all three didn't play great. I think Holden made the best passes out of all of them, but it was, again, it was in mop-up time. You know, they had some of their backups in. The game was over at that point. But I think going forward, it's probably Robbie's job to lose. Um, I, I think we'll see him next week against Georgia. I uh, think you're going to have to have to use him, his ability to run, to, to be effective at all for, for us right now. I, I just don't think – I don't think Peyton's got it. I don't think he's the guy. Um, I think it's a swing and a miss in the transfer portal. You know what happens. You never know. And maybe he comes out and it's a completely different quarterback. But from, from what I've seen – in the bigger games, he's just not it. I don't know if it's the pressure that gets to him. I don't know if it's he's just not as good as we thought he was. But I don't think he's going to be the guy going forward. I think he'll end up – if he is this weekend, I think he'll end up losing the job to Robbie because Robbie's 
he's gotten better and better for sure. He's got to get a little more consistent passing the ball. But, I mean, hell, if Peyton's that bad at passing the ball, take your chances with Robbie. I mean, yeah, he's inconsistent. But we've seen him in the last year and a couple times this year. He's able to make some throws, and he's obviously gotten better. But I, I think if it's me, I'm rolling the dice with Robbie and, and seeing what, what he can do. But I, I think Peyton's lost this job, man. I think he's lost the team. I don't think he has much confidence in himself, and I, I think that the players don't have much confidence in him after this weekend. I mean, it kind of showed later in the, the third quarter. It's just like that there was there was nothing going. The offense just looked lost the, the whole second half. It was it was really embarrassing to watch. Again, I, I didn't think Auburn was going to win, but I definitely didn't think they were going to look this bad. Uh, also, that there, there were some injuries on the defensive side of the ball that, that kind of hurt uh, that the players were out. But, man, it just – I don't know, man. I was I was scratching my head after this game was over. Like, man, what in the world is Auburn going to look like the rest of the year? I mean, I was sitting in the I was at Stanford or Stanford game, excuse me, two weeks ago, and uh, I, I, I Haley was with me, and and I was sitting there, and Auburn was up what, what were we thirty five to ten at the time or whatever it was. Auburn was up big, and I was just sitting there looking disgusted. And she looked at me, she's like, "What's wrong?" And I was like. Auburn's going to lose a lot of games this year. And she was like, look at the scoreboard. Uh, Y'all are winning big. I was like, yeah, it's Sanford. Auburn's going to lose a lot of games this year. I mean, you could even see it in the Sanford game. It's just like things weren't clicking. And then really uh, against better competition and the competition that Auburn's going to face the rest of the year, you can just tell, man, it's it's probably not going to be pretty. I think they win more games in 2012. But, man, it's just I don't think Auburn's going to win a lot of games this year unless they figure something out and figure it out fast. But man, Hugh Freeze has got a he's got a handful uh, uh, with what he's got to fix on the offensive side of the ball. Defensive wise, they look like showstoppers. They're playing out of their minds, and and I'm nothing but pleased with the defense. But offensive wise, man, it is it is ugly, ugly, ugly on all facets of the game. I don't know why, man. I just have a sneaky suspicion they're going to play Georgia really tough this weekend. I, they always I do. Yeah, I I don't. I mean, obviously, after they looked offensively, you're thinking, man, going against the Georgia defense, like, that's I, – I don't know. I do think they're going to be better offensively this week. I, I think – I don't know. I, I think they're going to play Georgia pretty tough. I don't think Georgia's completely figured things out either. I mean, obviously, they're they're great. Don't get me wrong. But, I mean, I mean you could ask them. I, I don't feel like they're playing – near to their capability yet. I think they're still figuring out some things as well. So it's their first road game. So I, I think I, I think Auburn plays them tough this weekend. I, I think I would probably lean Auburn to cover. I think the line's 16 or 17. I, I, I just think Auburn's going to play them tough. I don't, I don't know if they can pull it out or not. But um, The only I, thing I, I don't think that is is because the offense can't do anything. I mean, they can't. Yeah. Can't go more than four or five plays, and if they do, they turn the dang ball over. So, against yeah. this defense, I don't know. I, I hope I hope they come out and they play, you know, with their hair on fire. But the way that our offense is looking right now, I'm I'm not confident in it. Yeah, I understand. I'm I'm really curious to see kind of what adjustments they make. As you mentioned, how they how they kind of play the the quarterback situation, and you know, is, is it is it Peyton get some? Is it Robbie Holden? You know, kind of how they you know, determine that plan going forward. I'm going to be watching closely. Um, but but should be a good one. I, I will say Josh Pay, he's been at, you know, he he does he goes to a game every Saturday. The last two games he's been to, he's like, he went to Missouri for the walk-off field goal against Kansas State and then a walk-off touchdown for Ohio State and Notre Dame. So he's like, man, I – He's got a thing for close games this year. Yeah. He's going to Auburn this Saturday. He said, you never know, man. Things happen in Jordan Hare. So, you crazier I, things have happened. So. I hope there's a walk-off win for Auburn this week. I just – I they're going to have – Auburn's going to have to take some some plays or, or – not plays, but they're going to have to take uh, – and, and do the things that South Carolina did, get the ball out quick, run some things underneath, get some, you know, some screens. I don't think Auburn ran a single screen – all weekend or all Saturday against Texas A&M, and there was pressure on them all game. I mean, I, I feel like that's one thing you can do to deter the pressure. Let the guys come through, dump it off, but do something underneath, some short screens, some screens to the receivers outside. 
uh, some crossing routes, some mesh routes, some stuff like that. You got to get the ball out quick. And UAB did the same thing to Georgia. And Georgia starts slow. Uh, they've been starting slow the last few weeks. So if Auburn's able to jump on them, I like the chances. But they've, they've got to do something to be able to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands and get it to our playmakers as quick as absolutely possible. And then I like our chances. But, man, uh, this is this has potential to be a really long year if Auburn's offense, mainly the quarterbacks and offensive line, don't figure it out. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, definitely got to find some answers pretty quick because it, it doesn't get any easier. You know, I mean, you got uh, the two-time champs coming in. And then, obviously, we know how the SEC schedule is after that for Auburn. So, you mentioned South Carolina, though. I kind of want to go ahead and jump jump ahead yeah. and talk about them a little bit because, man, Spencer Rattler, I continue to be super impressed with him, man. He has just got complete command of this offense. And if his offensive line's giving him time, man, he's finding his playmakers. Like, I just see a comfort level with him right now that, you saw at the end of last year, and he's just kind of building on that. Um, man, I, I thought he was terrific in this game against Mississippi State. South Carolina ends up winning at home 37-30. to 30. Really a, a great back-and-forth kind of game. It felt like both teams were mirroring each other the entire yeah, game, time. you know. Um, I believe South Carolina uh, jumped out 14 nothing pretty early. Mississippi State responds. It's 20-17 to 17 at half. And then they kind of, you know, it was like one, you know, South Carolina gets stopped, then Mississippi State gets stopped, you know, a score, score. It, it was just kind of a, a mirror image almost to each other. And I was just super impressed with both these quarterbacks. But kind of talking about Spencer Rattler, goes 18 of 20, 288, three touchdowns. I thought he did a nice job with his legs to extend oh, yeah. the plays, got out of the pocket a few times, uh, found guys open in the flat, or and had a couple of nice scrambles too. Um, you know, kind of beating the defense downfield. Had had a, quite a, a couple really nice games with his legs. So, and then Will Rogers, um, he he goes thirty of forty eight <laughs> for four eighty seven. I had to double check and make sure that number was right. Thank you, Tulu Griffin. Yeah, um, they weren't able to be as balanced as they'd like to be. I mean, obviously. Uh, Marks only twelve carries, twenty seven yards. They they weren't able to really have any balance at all. Um, but all in all, it, it was a, it was a great game. It was a really nice atmosphere there in Columbia. Uh, but just kind of give me your thoughts on Spencer Rattler and just kind of what you what you've seen for him this progression because he he looks in total command when his offensive line's giving him some time. Uh, he's getting it to his playmakers and the, and they're making plays. Yeah, absolutely. South Carolina's offensive line stepped up this week. I mean, I know they weren't playing the you know <clears throat> a top three defense for sure, but. Mississippi State's defense is able to get to the quarterback and bring pressure, and I felt like South Carolina did a good job of picking up pressure. I mean, Mississippi State was able to get to Spencer Rattler a time or two, but like you said, he was able – and he was even gimped up a little bit. He was able to still extend plays with his legs, rolled out a couple times, found a touchdown one time rolling out to the right, threw it across his body into the end zone. Um, but I, I thought he did a fantastic job. He, he's finally, you know, coming into what we expect him to be. Uh Honestly, if Mississippi State – Will Rogers threw a pick down in there in the red zone, I believe he they were on like the 14-15, <clears throat> and he threw a pick on like the eight-yard line. If he doesn't throw a pick there, this potentially this game could have gone to overtime. Uh, I, I thought Tulu Griffin had a well of a game. He had like 250-something yards and a touchdown. He ran the ball for like, I don't know, 15, 16 yards, whatever it was. But this is a reminder – or this was a lot like – uh, the last two, three years, old Miss, or Mississippi State the offense, because Will Rogers threw it 48 times. They only ran for 32 yards. Uh, it, it definitely, I feel like they went back to what they knew would work, what they've always been able to do, and that's just let Will Rogers be in shotgun and pick defenses apart. They beat them over. They beat South Carolina over the top a little bit, and they weren't able to get a whole lot of pressure until really the, the set late in the second half. They started getting to them a little bit, but. I thought Will Rogers played a fantastic game along with Spencer Rattler, two of the better quarterbacks in the league. It just, it just hurts that their, their talent around them isn't top tier like they are. Um, but yeah, Spencer Rattler, man, he, he's coming into, into himself for sure. He's really taking a hold of this offense. Uh, he's helping himself out in the draft stock. Like you said, the ability to extend plays with his legs. We've, no, we've known he could do it. He can do it. 
We haven't really seen it a whole lot since he's been at South Carolina, except for the last few weeks and last season. Uh, but but this week, I, I thought he did a great job. Uh, you know, he had a couple of first down runs, um, but but extending the play and finding guys open uh, downfield, I, I thought he did a fantastic job. And and I was expecting South Carolina to win by more than they were. But man, it's crazy how Vegas hits it on the head just about every single time. I mean, I think at the line was six, six and a half. I think it may have closed at six. But, yeah, they won by, by seven. But like I said, man, if Will Rogers doesn't throw a touchdown down there in the red zone, I, I think this potentially – this game had a potential to go into overtime being a tie game. But but South Carolina's defense, man, Shane Beamer was not happy with them going into halftime. He was talking to Cole Kubelik uh, before he went into the tunnel. He was talking about his offense is playing great. Uh, they're able to, you know, <clears throat> piece drives together and, and put it in the end zone. But – that the defense can't get pressure on Will Rogers and they're getting beat over the top consistently. And then in the second half, it was kind of a lot of the same, but then in the fourth quarter, the South Carolina's defense really figured it out. They were able to get pressure, stop the run, and um, and do some things that was able to, to shorten drives for Mississippi State and to, and to end their drives. But I, I thought for, for the most part, South Carolina had control of this game, even when they were back and forth, back and forth. I, I never thought that South Carolina was going to lose this game because it was just – the momentum was there, and I felt like it never left South Carolina's sideline. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, I thought both quarterbacks played great. I just thought Spencer Rattler just had an easier time just because they were able to be more balanced on offense. They were able to run the football a lot more effectively than Mississippi State was. So I felt like there was a lot more on Will Rogers' shoulders in this game. Like you mentioned, it kind of felt like the the old, you know, the – air raid type offense out of shotgun you know they weren't really able to establish the run game and and weren't able to really stick with it I think like they would want to um kind of how they have this year so um yeah I I thought a lot more was on Will Rogers shoulders but I thought he played great too and and Spencer Rattler just just was in complete command really of the offense and as you mentioned Tula Griffin just went absolutely nuts uh this stat line's insane. I mean, seven catches, 256 yards. <laughs> I mean, crazy. Uh, and then I just want to say, too, you know, we've been on record talking about love South Carolina skill players, their, their weapons they has to throw to. Um, and we talk about if their offensive line plays well, this this is a super explosive offense. But <laughs> Xavier Leggett, a big Pass man should not be him. able to move that good. Like, Man, he on the screen. I don't know what his forty is, or what, but he looks like he is flying screen. And, and then I, he pulled just, away on a deep ball too. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't think a two hundred thirty pound man should be able to run that quick. So, but yeah, he he's a beast though. I mean, he's like you said, he's like I don't even know if you could call it sneaky speed because it, it's not really sneaky. It looks fast, but he and, man, and that he goes to the, my, my theory of if you're a wide receiver and your name is Xavier. You're a dog. There's another yeah. one right there. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a dude, man. He he's fun to watch. And like I said, I was super impressed. He got in the open field, and it, it was all she wrote. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really high on their, their skill players. Trey Knox that has fit in nicely with them as well. And we know about Juice Wells and and kind of what he brings to the table too. So, um, kind of we'll see how the South Carolina team continues to develop. Um, same with Mississippi State. I, I know they've. I guess you'd say struggled a little bit. I mean, they they lost to LSU pretty handily. It was a, it was a tough matchup with those with those receivers, and and then obviously you know they fought hard in this game, just couldn't quite you know get a stop or two when they needed it. weren't weren't really able to force turnovers like they would like. So um, I'm I'm kind of curious to see both these teams going forward. Uh, we'll talk about Alabama in a minute. They got Mississippi State this this week in Starkville. It'll be interesting. So. Um, and in South Carolina, they, they've got a super tough schedule ahead as well, you know, the rest of the way. So, um, but, yeah, they're, they're a fun offense to watch. And Spencer, Spencer Rattler's operating at a high level right now. Absolutely. One of my favorite games I watched this weekend, I did lose some money on it, but it was, it was one of the better games of the weekend was Arkansas and LSU. Man, Arkansas, they, they really showed the world that we're not the same team that just lost to BYU a few weeks ago. Uh, their offensive line and KJ Jefferson played really good. KJ Jefferson also was able to use his legs a couple times to extend plays and, and to to extend drives. I thought the Arkansas offensive line, especially in the first half, did a great job of picking up 
uh, blitzes and, and picking up pressures. And KJ Jefferson was able to move around in the pocket and make plays. I believe that th this was also a game that mirrored themselves a lot. KJ Jefferson was 21 of 31 for 289. Jane Daniels was 20 of 29 for 320. Jane Daniels had four touchdowns, one interception. KJ Jefferson had three touchdowns, two interceptions. Arkansas ran for 137 yards, and LSU ran for 189 yards. So this game also mirrored itself, and they went back and forth, back and forth, trading blows. Um, but the defense in the first half was really – they really showed out. There was not a touchdown scored until the last 48 seconds of the first half. Arkansas scores a touchdown. Receiver makes a hell of a play, gets pass interference, and still catches it, keeps his toes in uh, the back corner of the end zone. And then LSU takes the ball with 42 seconds, I believe, drives down the field and ends up punching it in themselves. Uh, and then in the second half, it, it was pretty much all, all offense. I mean, the defense kind of fell off. There was 30, 32 points scored in the, in the, or 42. 42 points scored in the second half. So the defense played great in the first half, and it was all offense the second half. But uh, I thought K.J. Jefferson, man, I thought he had a, a breakout game. I know they lost, but I, I thought he played one of the better games of his career this past Saturday. He, he really – he was trying to will those guys to victory 100%. Uh, he did have – he lost – he had two fumbles but didn't lose either one of them, but he did throw two picks. Uh, Jaden Daniels in the – I think it was the second quarter threw an interception – in the very next play for Arkansas, they threw an interception, gave it right back. So the first half was kind of sloppy offensively. Then they all they, – they sharpened up and figured it out in the second half. But I, I thought this was one of the most exciting games of the weekend. I didn't think it – I mean, the line was 17 and a half. LSU was 17 and a half point favorites. I didn't think it was going to be as good of a game as it was. And, and Arkansas proved me wrong, man. I mean, they played out of their minds defensively, offensively. They, they, were, they were clicking on all cylinders for sure. Yeah, this was a really fun game. I mean, it, it seems like these these Arkansas LSU games, man, they they're always suit. I mean, I, I think the, the last the last three have been decided by I think four points or less or, or something yeah. like that. It's been super competitive. Um, but yeah, like you said, I was super impressed with KJ Jefferson, the offensive line. I thought they hung in really nicely, and you know, KJ did a nice job of of avoiding pressure a few times, buying a little time in the pocket, finding his receivers down the field. And I, I thought the receivers played really good too. And they have a, fr a freshman tight end, Luke Luke Haas, I, I guess yeah. you say his name. And the dude is a hoss because uh, – For sure. I mean, he he's a really good-looking young player uh, for a freshman. I, th I thought he made some some nice plays. He, uh, he caught that long uh, touchdown pass down the right sideline. And another a prime example of KJ Jefferson buying time, stepped up in the pocket, moved out to his right, and obviously with that that running threat that he did a little bit. Yeah, it, it makes those DBs of safeties bite up, you know, thinking he's going to take off for a first down, and then boom, hit him, hit uh, Luke Haas over the top for a touchdown, and thought he had some really nice plays, and they kind of they kind of featured him, um, you know, in the offense this week, so. Yeah, I, I was super impressed. The, the main thing with LSU is we talked about their their secondary concerns. I mean, this was a unit that brought in a ton of transfers. Haven't really clicked yet. Um, you know, offensively, we know what they are. Jaden Daniels is operating at a high level, and they're, they're athletes. They have, you know, Malik Neighbors. Brian Thomas had a great game. Uh, Mason Taylor is a really good sophomore tight end. Like, they, they've got weapons all over the place, so – um, we know what they are offensively, but that secondary still hasn't been able to come around yet and, and play at the level that they hope. So that that's kind of an area they got to tighten up going forward. But but give KJ and, and Arkansas offensive line credit because they were able to give him time to make some plays down the field. And I, I, I was super impressed with them. I mean, I didn't know exactly how this game would go, but kind of knowing – Arkansas's DNA, I wasn't surprised at the fight. This is a big rivalry game. And even Sam Pittman said coming off a BYU game, he's like, you know, not basically saying not many people are going to give us a chance, but they they felt like they had a really good chance to kind of shot some people, pull upset, and they they almost did it. It just I, I thought LSU's offense just a little too much in, in mm -hmm. the end. They just couldn't get the stop or two they needed there in the second half. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, 
Arkansas has got A and M this week, and A and M's a six and a half point favorite at Arkansas. Might might have to lay the line with the pigs, man. I might have to. Yeah, I'm really curious to see uh, Connor Wigman or Wigman's health. So there's kind of been some conflicting reports. Jimbo Fisher said today that he has a, a – or there was a report that he had a high ankle sprain and that it would be two to four weeks potentially. And then Jimbo Fisher basically said it, it wasn't an ankle sprain. He was kind of day-to-day, so kind of some conflicting reports. So I don't know if he's going to be in there or not for that for that Arkansas game this weekend. I think As they're fine with Max Johnson anyway. Yeah, he, he played super well, and I, I think – even myself, I think that was an area for Texas A&M, like them keeping Max Johnson on this roster, man, that, that was a huge kind of under-the-radar thing that I don't think many people thought about. We, we saw how big that ended up being. Um, and how cool week. is it that he threw his touchdown pass, his brother Jake Johnson's first touchdown pass came from his brother Max. and I just thought that was really cool. I hated seeing it, obviously, but I thought that was yeah. really cool. That was really cool. I saw somebody uh, tweeted out said Johnson and Johnson, a family company. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was that was pretty clever. But yeah, that that was cool to see. And I, I'm like you, I think they'll be just fine with Max Johnson in there. Um, as you mentioned, that's going to be a tough. That's a that's a rivalry game as well. So I'm I'm curious to see kind of their you know Connor Wigman's health and and if he's able to go at all. I have a suspicion. He's probably not going to play this week, and they're probably going to try to get him back for the Alabama game on yeah. October 7th, which is the following week. So, I don't know. That's just kind of my suspicion. I think if he's not – if they feel like he can't go, I don't think they're going to push him because they feel good with Max Johnson or are confident in him. I think they'll probably try to rest him this week, just depending on how bad it is. But I think they'll try to get him back probably from the Alabama game. If I had to guess, but I'm I'm curious to see you know how that shakes out this weekend. Um, kind of getting to Alabama a little bit. Um, I tell you what, I text you at halftime and I was absolutely disgusted. Um, I don't know how in the world you go you you block a punt, your first and goal with the one. How in the hell do you end up kicking a 42 yard field goal when you have it first and goal on the one? I mean, just are you in shotgun? Yeah, why are you in shotgun? And and Nick Saban actually said that today in his press conference. Somebody asked him about it, and he's like, he's like, I don't know why we're in shotgun there. And I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm like, you're the head football coach. If you don't like it, call a timeout and tell him to get <laughs> under center. Like, I mean, yeah. what Miss Terry don't have to have all the timeouts. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I've I've always you know I've always heard people say that he he likes to save his timeouts and take them home to Miss Terry, like he can <laughs> turn them in for something. But um, no, nah, I'm I'm just kidding. But yeah, obviously, I I don't think you'll see that again. I mean, and it'd be a mute point if Seth McLaughlin would actually snap the ball to Jalen Milrow and quit snapping at his feet, snapping it over his head. If you just yeah. snap it to his hands would be okay, but, but uh, yeah, it was, it, it was kind of – I felt like the, the same old, same old in the first half a little bit. And then the second half, they were able to come out. Uh, the defense, too, the defense has, has played great this year. Um, I think you can tell a big difference uh, with Kevin Steele, the toughness. I think the, you know, kind of rallying to the football. I thought the tackling has been a lot more fundamentally sound. and. The fourth down blitz they brought late in the game on Jackson Dart, a double safety blitz, man. Now I, I was like, I was so happy to see that. I, I I can't even tell you. So, um, that that was cool to see. A lot more aggressiveness, I feel like, but just the tenacity. Like this defense really hits people. Um, it's it's a really physical defense. So, I mean, all in all, I've been super pleased with how the defense has played so far this year. The big questions have just been, you know, quarterback play. Um, you know, it's it's nice to say they finally settled on somebody, I, you know, settled on Jalen Milrow. I think that was kind of solidified in this game. Still had an ugly interception, you know, throwing into double coverage. That's, that's plays we've talked about. 
on this podcast. Everybody else on their podcast have talked about it. Uh, those are the plays you got to cut out. Like those are killers that you you have to eliminate because, as we've talked about, this is a this is a low margin for error type of football. Like this isn't your to a tongue of a low, uh, you know, ride outs, uh, Alabama offense, like right. that puts 45, 50 a game on people. That's just not this offense. It, it's going to be what you saw in the second half, able to control the line of scrimmage, which was a blessing to see. Um, running back, Jace McClellan getting downhill, mixed in some quarterback runs, which were really nice to see as well. And, and I felt like this game plan was more to Jalen Miller's strengths and, Outside of that one interception, I thought he played extremely well. He, he yeah. stayed in the pocket, got hit a couple times, made some nice throws down the field, Um, you know, used his legs, as I mentioned, and just thought it was a much stronger and, and much smarter game plan to fit his strengths in the second half. And, and the defense, I feel like, just fed off that even more and thought they did a great job. So, um you know, we'll see kind of where that goes from here, but I, I definitely thought you saw some positive signs, you know, if you're Alabama and, and saw some things you really want to see. There's a lot to clean up still. It's just one week. It's only one step forward. But um, kind of what we've seen the last, you know, two weeks prior, um, you know, I, I was pleased to see that. And I, I hopefully they can, you know, continue that forward, uh, you know, this week and, and ahead in the SEC schedule. Yeah, I I, th- I think we will. I mean, other than the first first quarter touchdown by Jackson Dart, they're pretty much shut down Ole Miss's offense. Uh, like I said, we've been talking about Kevin Steele and that defense and what he's going to bring to it and what they're going to be for a long time. And I'm not shocked with how well they're performing. Uh, as it's pretty much on par with what I was thinking was going to happen. The offense is just usually – both teams are clicking at, or both sides of the ball are clicking at the same time. And if something has to come along, it's just something, something minor. But I feel like the offense is starting to come along now. We talked about last week, this was a big game, kind of a turning point in the season of what they're going to be. And then, you know, Alabama, they got Mississippi State this week. I think that's another, another team that obviously they're much better than. And I think that they're going to win this game, but it's another stepping stone for, for where they're going to be at the end of this season. And I think that with this game, they're going to be able to work on some things that they need to and continue to improve. And they're only going to get better and better. And I, I, but a hundred percent, this game was a, was a big time, uh, you know, what, what are we going to be the rest of this season coming into Saturday? And I, and I think that they showed everybody that, you know, we're not going to put up 45 points, but we're going to be dominant on the defensive side of the football. And we're going to give us a chance to, to win ball games and be in every ball game that we play. So I, I wasn't shocked, uh, by, by this performance at all um i i didn't take the, the game i was i was going back and forth on if i wanted to take the line or not uh i didn't end up taking it i was just going to watch it as you know just a consumer not not a better and and i'm i'm kind of kicking myself that i didn't bet bet that game because i didn't do so hot this weekend but uh it was a really good game a really fun game and and Jalen milrose coming into himself it, you know he's he's figuring things out and he's he's only going to get better and I think that each and every week it's going to be a, a different, but in a better way, Jalen Milrow and the offense that we're seeing from Alabama, because that defense is just going to be, keep being the same. And like you said, flying to the football, being aggressive, being, you know, dominant. And and I, I expect to see more of that. And I think that they're going to run away with this game against Mississippi state this weekend. I mean, they're a 14 and a half point favorite. That's pretty large uh, going on the road playing Mississippi state, but I, I think that they're going to cover that this weekend. And, and I think that, from here on out, the offense is going to get better and better, and we're going to see uh, better product from the offense than what we had the last three, four weeks. Yeah, I think t- getting Tyler Booker back this week was big. You know, he missed the South Florida game, which is no excuse. I mean, they, they should have been able to boy South Florida around, but I do think getting him back was big. He actually won the SEC Offensive Lineman of the Week this week, so that kind of shows his importance. I mean, he's – probably the best, you know, player on that offensive line. Um, yet this matchup with Mississippi State, the last two the last two weeks, both Jaden Daniels and Spencer Rattler, they went a combined 48 of 54 against this wow. Mississippi State defense. So I don't know what the math that's like, I think close to 90%, I think, completions. So probably high eighties, I guess. So um so this should be, you know, hopefully a good stepping stone for him. 
Mississippi State, they are aggressive defense. And that's Nick Saban kind of alluded to that today. They play a three three five, I guess, which is a little, you know, unconventional. But I think, like I said, the main thing with Jalen Miro is just limiting his turnovers. Like, like a punt is not the worst thing in the world with Steve. Right. Like you, you hear that saying all the time, end every drive with a kick. Like, that's it. A, a, a punt, you've got a great punter. I mean, James Burnham's top five in the country and, and you know, punting average, 48 yards a punt. You know, Will Riker's a weapon. You know, he, he's been money. So, um, so you got weapons on special teams in, in the kicking game. So, like, just don't force the football and just don't, you know, don't make those plays that kill you, you know, like like the interception, like throwing into double coverage or not putting the ball to the back pile on, like, you know, the a couple of throws he made against Texas. Like, those are the kind of throw. And I, I think he will cut down on those as, you know, as he gains more experience. I mean, he, he's still, you know, a young quarterback as far as, you know, starting experience. So, I think he'll get better and better. I mean, the, the good thing about him is he does throw a good deep ball, which is, you know, like a, there's a lot of quarterbacks that that's kind of the last thing they do is, is throw the ball, you know, you know, it, it's kind of the last thing to develop, I guess you could say. So that that's nice that he, he does do that, you know. So at least with him in there, like you may have a few – you may have a turnover here and there, which has happened, but you do have a guy that – people they have to respect his arm because he can stretch the field so that does you know give defenses a threat that they have to you know contain against so but yeah I, I was very pleased with the way he played and um yeah I, I hopefully they'll continue to mix in some play action some some rpos you know the quarterback you know run game they ran quarterback power a couple times with the running back as a lead blocker that you know on you know second and third and short a few times so it was it was a really good to see a good step in the right direction but I I want to see if they're able to continue that um that's going to be key going forward because you got some really tough games you know ahead on the schedule um you know you got the A and M here in a couple of weeks we know about their defensive front you still got Tennessee and LSU um lot lot of challenging games left ahead so. We'll see kind of how they develop and and see if they can continue that this week. Absolutely, and you know we we touched on Jordan Auburn a little bit, but I, I want to get into something that Hugh Free said, and he's reaching like Dabo Sweeney Dabo Sweeney level of cornball saying this. He was in his presser this week, or it might have been today or yesterday, and somebody asked him about you know how much hate is in this rivalry with with Georgia and Auburn, and he said you know I haven't been here long. So I'm really not, you know, for sure about it. He said, but I don't think we should be fueled to play by hate, hatred of others. I think we should be fueled to play by love of others. And I was like, dude, I like you a lot, but that is some Dabo Swinney type crap right there. I mean, you that is the biggest cornball saying that he said since he stepped in Auburn, Alabama. I mean, good grief. Get, get out of here with that crap. There is hatred through and through. It's Deep South's oldest rivalry. And when I heard that today, I was like, what in the world did he just say? Cornball. Absolute cornball. I don't want one of those. I want a guy yeah. who's going to, you know, fuel the hatred, build on the rivalry, get the fan base behind it. But that stuff right there, get out of here with that, dude. Yeah, it was like the um, – it was like the love, like the love that he has for his team and his program motivates him. It's not hatred for the other team that motivates him. I mean, I get what he was trying to say. I get what he's saying but, too, but it's corny as hell. Yeah, but I mean, this is football, man. It's for, I mean, it doesn't mean you literally hate the other person. Like, like I hate Auburn, you hate Alabama, but it's like you don't, you don't literally like hate. I mean, you hate them, but you don't literally like hate the people. Like, I'm not right. wish, I'm not wishing bad things. Like, right. I want them to lose a football game. I'm not wishing bad things upon them. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I don't, I don't want their their crops to yield no bear or anything. Like, I just want to lose a football game. You know what I'm 100%. saying? So, <laughs> but, so, I, I get what he's saying, but, man, this is SEC football, man. There, there's hatred everywhere. I mean, I mean, let's be honest. Everybody hates everybody. I mean, that's just the way it is. Oh, yeah. I, 
I mean, well, you want to be your team and hate everybody else. So that's that's how I view it. So um, now I enjoy watching all the other teams. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I pull for the league as a whole. Like I want the league. I want it to be the best league in the country. I mean, obviously, but but then again, though, in the same breath, like these are the teams you're directly competing against. So you know, you you kind of you want them to do well for for the conference as a whole, but then again, you know, you're directly competing against them. So it's like you also don't want them to win. So, right. you know, but, yeah, I mean, it's SEC football, man. Everybody hates everybody. Like, we're – this is, you know, at the end of the day, like, we don't we don't hate each other as people, but we, we hate, you know, the team. The team you pull for, for you sure. Know, yeah, we, we want to have a bad performance on Saturday. but Yeah, 100%. Um, we want to recruit bad and everything like that, but even though – the SEC as a whole, you know, is never going to recruit bad. So, uh, All right, I got a question for you, though. So, Florida and Kentucky. Kentucky just put up a well of a game against Vandy this past weekend. Florida played okay. They kind of didn't struggle with Charlotte, but I don't think they handled them the way everybody expected them to after last week's performance. Florida is ranked number 22 in the country. Kentucky is unranked. It's at Kentucky. It's an early a.m. Early kickoff, 11 o'clock kickoff. And Kentucky's a two and a half point favorite. What are your thoughts on this game? Man, that this is a tough one. I mean, I, I feel like I feel like you know a little bit more about Florida. Just I mean, they played at Utah, they played Tennessee. I, I like I don't feel that I know really a lot about Kentucky yet. I mean, I looked their schedule here: Ball State, Eastern Kentucky, Akron, and then Vandy. I'm like I, I don't I don't really I mean Kentucky, I believe Kentucky's a good football team I I think they are but I haven't really seen them be tested yet to to know what they're about I, I do feel I know a lot more about Florida but on the same token I don't really know what Florida I'm going to get either right I think I'm going to get a good Florida you know I would expect that obviously they they played bad against Utah first game yeah, you know, we kind of know the circumstances. You know, they play McNeese, obviously bounce back, play well, you know, considering. Then they, they surprise everybody, and you know, they beat Tennessee by double digits, but, you know, kind of a complete 180 from the Utah game. Then, as you mentioned, not totally unexpected, but they didn't, you know, they didn't really pull away from Charlotte. They actually only won 22 to 7. So, right. Um, so, but I would expect a pretty good Florida, you know, performance here. So, man, th- this one for me is really tough to say. I mean, I, I'm – this is one of those, say it all the time, a coin flip game. Mm-hmm. It's a two-and-a-half spread for Kentucky. I really don't know. I, I kind of want to get your thoughts on it because I'm, I'm really completely torn just because I, I feel like I don't have a – an awesome read on Kentucky yet because I haven't really seen them play, you know, a top 25 caliber team yet. I agree. And I don't think that we've seen Florida – well, they haven't played well on the road or in a neutral environment yet. They play really good at home. Uh, but I just don't know that they've got the firepower to, to last four quarters with this Kentucky team. I mean, this Kentucky team has been built – you know, Mark Stoops has done a really good job of building his program, getting the guys in there that he wants to get in there. They've gotten better and better each week. They're undefeated. They're at home. I expect Kentucky to win this game. I think I think the two and a half is probably just right. Uh, I think Devin Leary, he's finally coming into himself and, and finding a way to, to, to control this offense, to make this offense his own. Um I expect Kentucky to win this game. I also need them to win this game because I got, you know, the future bet for Florida. Uh, I'm surprised Florida's ranked, though, to be honest with you. I mean, they beat, they beat Tennessee, and they beat them pretty handily. But, again, it was at home. Man, playing at Ben Hill Griffith, that, that is a big-time, uh, you know, it's a big-time advantage for, for the Florida Gators when, they, when they're out there playing in front of their home crowd. Uh, but Kentucky, man, they, they get rowdy, and they've been good the last few years. So that fan base is starting to get – you know, they're they're a legit SEC fan base for sure. They're they have their expectations of what they think that they can be and need to be. Um they, they think that they should be a nine ten win team every single year. Uh they've proven that the last few years that they are capable of doing that. So I think Kentucky keeps their their undefeated streak going and I think they beat Florida. But 
again, you're right. We don't know what Florida team we're going to get. I feel like Kentucky's more consistent than the Florida the, uh, this year and in the last few years. So that's really why I'm leaning more towards Kentucky is their consistency of what their program is and what they usually are as a team. But again, you like you said, it's a coin flip game could go either way. But if I'm if I'm a betting man and I am probably staying away from this game, but if I'm betting on it, I'm probably taking Kentucky at, at least the money line. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it you probably have to lean Kentucky at home. You know, I mean, like I said, I, I'm like you. I think the two and a half's dead on the money. I'm I'm personally not going to take this game, at least unless I, I just get a much better feel of it. I, I don't right. believe I am, though. Um, but, yeah, I'm really curious to see this because, I mean, you look at Kentucky, they're 4-0. If they can get this one at home, they have uh, – they're – at, I believe – I can't remember if they have a bye week or not. They may have a bye. No, they don't. But next Saturday, they're at Georgia. I mean, that could be a 5-0 and Kentucky team at Georgia. I mean, that's a that's a huge, huge game. So – um, and then Florida, you know, they've got Vandy after this, so they could go into that game at South Carolina sitting at 5-1, and one. Uh, you know, potentially, you know. So, they, you know, that. they got Kentucky and then Vandy, which they, they should beat. So – um, so yeah, I thought this is a huge like momentum game for for both teams. I mean, both teams are coming in feeling good, obviously, but like who can kind of carry that momentum forward and, and springboard them? Um, because you know this is a game that you know Florida's probably going to overachieve if they can if they can get this game. They're sitting at five and one going and playing at South Carolina, like they're right there in the thick of the the SEC East race. So. Um, yeah, I'm, re- I'm really curious to see this game. Um, I, th- I feel like two pretty compatible teams. But as you mentioned, though, Kentucky is definitely more on solid footing. You know, they're, they are more proven. I mean, Mark Stoops has been there longer. Um, but but I do expect a good Florida performance, and I'm, I'm anxious to see what they do uh, at Kentucky. Absolutely. And, and what about the Ole Miss-LSU game? LSU is a field goal favorite. Traveling to Ole Miss, six o'clock kickoff or five o'clock kickoff, excuse me. Um, man, I, I think this game, they played Ole Miss played Alabama really well, to be honest. The whole game they played them really consistently. Uh, and then the Bama just ended up pulling away. But I I think this Ole Miss team could give LSU some fits. I really do. Uh I, this is a completely different LSU team than what played Florida State. I think if they played them right now, LSU probably wins that game. Florida State's been kind of sputtering uh, the last few weeks. Not sputtering, but they haven't been, you know, all world like they were against LSU. So, I I think LSU had the chance to, to pull an upset here and give LSU their second loss. Um, I think Jackson Dark's done a really good job. I think he's grown and matured for, for sure. He, he's a hand, hand over fist, the leader of this team. Um, but like you said – LSU secondary has kind of been the question mark. They've played better than, than what people were expecting them to. But I, I think Ole Miss has a chance to expose that LSU secondary this weekend with Jackson Dart and company. Yeah, I, I do too. I think there's some plays to be made there. Um, I'm Man, I'm super fired up for this game. I'm really curious. I want to see how Ole Miss responds. I expect them to. Um, you know, they always put a lot in that Alabama game. Like, it's, a, it's always a personal game for Lane Kiffin. Like, he – he wants to beat Nick Saban so badly he can't stand it. I mean, he just – he tweets about it all week and this going to be the last time and all this, you know, which I kept wondering why he was saying that. I knew he was referencing maybe Nick Saban's, you know, going to retire or whatever, but I did forget that now, you know, divisions are going away, so it's only going to be every other year. So, yep. um, I – when he said that after the game, like he said he was going to miss this, I think he's referring to it happening every year right. more so than like that. I know he's, he's always kind of, you know, digging in, trying to, you know, stir the pot a little bit. So I knew he was kind of mentioning the, re- the retirement as well. But, um, but yeah, I think it was just as much to do with, you know, the divisions going away and it only happened every other year now, but. Um, but I do want to see how gotta, they've got to keep Malik Neighbors under under wraps. I mean, Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas. I mean, Brian Thomas had two touchdowns this past weekend, and one of his touchdowns, the tip ball, he made that second DB look stupid when he juked him out. And made him. I mean, he made that dude fall down. But 
if they can keep those two guys, you're not going to stop them. You, you can't stop those two guys. They're too good to stop. But if you can slow them down and just keep them from having the games they've been having the last few weeks, I think that gives Ole Miss a lot better chance. But that, that's – I feel like that's got to be their their main priority on defense, that they got to slow their receivers down. Ole Miss has to slow LSU receivers down, um, you know, jam them up on the line, you know, get a little contact here and there, make them scared to catch the ball, hear, hear footsteps, you know, things like that. Because every pass I've seen Malik Neighbors catch, he's got seven, eight yards of cushion from the DB. Now, he can make the contested catches. He's done it plenty of times. But I feel like every time he is wide freaking open. They've got to do a great job of putting the clamps on him and just slowing him down and, and making him earn the catches, not just getting them wide open. Yeah, I, I really feel like this is going to be somewhere. I think this is a game that's in the 30s written all over it. I mean, I think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to be like the LSU-Arkansas type game. I think it's going to be a back and forth kind of affair, kind of like that LSU-Arkansas second half this past mm-hmm. week. Like They're kind of bow trade blows. I just – I just don't think LSU secondary is really going to slow Ole Miss down. I mean, I right. think there's plays to be made there. I do think their front can cause some problems. So, that's I probably give LSU a little bit of an edge in the game, but I, I think that's why it's a three-point line. I think they're a little bit better up front than, than Ole Miss is. But then again, I, I, don't, th- I don't think Ole Miss's secondary is really going to be able to contain them very well I just nobody's really had answers for them so far um but so I, I think this is a game that's going to be in the 30s things will be super interesting wouldn't be surprised at all if Ole Miss won this game but I think just because of of LSU's front seven I, I think they're a little bit better overall on defense so I'm, I'm gonna lean I'm gonna lean LSU slightly but you know if 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 Ole Miss is able to force a turnover or two, you know, then I, I think they got a really good chance to pull this one out. Absolutely. I'm probably going to bet this game, and I'm, I'm probably going to bet the over, if I'm being honest. Uh, I, I've been thinking that, you know, ever since I saw the the line, I was like, ah, line's a little low. I don't know either way. It could go either way, but I, I'm definitely hitting the over on this game. Um, what about South Carolina, Tennessee? Traveling to Neyland Stadium, South Carolina's, you know, they're, they're getting better and better each week. They got some momentum building. I know they lost to Georgia and they didn't have a good second half, but they they definitely took a step forward in that Georgia game. And then obviously this past week, uh, they looked really good offensively. We talked about that earlier. The offensive line's getting better. They're picking up protection. And, and, and Spencer Rattler's getting better and better. And, and really, he's the driving force of this offense. I mean, obviously every quarterback is, but he, he's the one who makes this thing go. And he is – I feel like he is in – you know, mid-season form. I know it's mid-season, but you know what I mean. He's he, he's in his in his zone right now, and I I think he's only going to get better and make this offense better. We talk about the weapons they got on the outside. Um, I don't think Tennessee's defensive front has really shown that they're going to blow up South Carolina's offensive line. So I think if they can just give Spencer Rattler some time and he can extend the plays like he was doing this past week, I think Tennessee's got everything. You know got it cut out for them this weekend and they're going to get them all they oh uh, South Carolina's going to give them all they want and South, uh, Tennessee's a 12 and a half point favorite I'm probably taking ten, uh, South, or South Carolina plus 12 and a half right now if I'm if I'm betting tonight Matt I'll be honest I'm I'm kind of on the same wavelength as you I, I was looking at right now when we you mentioned it I pulled it up I was curious to because I, I didn't know the line on it yet I saw it I was like man that's a, that's a little rich I think I mean yeah. I know this is obviously it's in Neyland. Tennessee's going to be ready to go. I mean, they got flat out embarrassed by South Carolina, ran up and down the field oh, yeah. on them. You know, they're in the – I mean, they could have made the playoffs. And and obviously that one just got away from them. Hinton Hooker got hurt. Not that it mattered. But so they're, they're going to be ready to go in this game. But the, the way Spencer Rattler's playing, and you mentioned if they're – if their offensive line, man, if they can just do what they did last week, give him some time, let him, you know, give him a chance to get out of the pocket a little bit, you know. I mean, he's he's got great weapons to throw to. I don't know if they win, but I, I do think they keep it within the 12 and a half. I think this yeah. is going to be a really – I think this has got a close game written all over it. But, um, you know, Tennessee, I feel like they really haven't found things yet. Like, they really haven't clicked either, and this is – this really isn't the Tennessee offense to to pull away from you. 
Right. Like that, they're they're more of a you know more of a run centric team, especially compared to what they were last year. Um, I mean, obviously they they still have some playmakers, but not really to the same level. They can stretch you, but it's not you don't have that same fear that you have with you know Jayla Hyatt, Cedric Tillman, and those guys. So um, I just I don't think this is the kind of offense that can just put points on you in a hurry like they, like it was a year ago. So I think South Carolina's got the offense to to keep pace with them. So I, I think it's gonna be a sixty minute dog fight, honestly. I'm I'm like you. I would if I if I'm picking it, I'm I'm leaning at least South Carolina to cover, I would think. Absolutely. I, I'm again we know I was a hate, hater on Spencer Rattler last year, but man, he dude's dude's found a soft spot for him, man. I've I've become a fan. I'm not gonna lie. I have become a fan uh, I like the way he plays, and I like his demeanor, and I feel like he's he's grown into the leader that he's supposed to be. That he wasn't really at at, at Oklahoma, but I feel like he's grown into that that role, and he's taking it by the by, by the reins for sure. I want to say too, and I want to give a little shout out to to Missouri. They're sitting at four and zero. Got the huge win over Kansas State. Walk off field goal. It was a uh, Awesome atmosphere there. I mean, that was a huge win for the program. They're playing at Vandy this week for the chance to go five and zero. Oh. Um, if they, I mean, they're sitting at five and zero. Oh. They're hosting LSU in week six and eleven o'clock game in Cuomo. Like, man, that that ought to be rocking. Like, I mean, Missouri sitting at five and zero. Oh. They're ranked twenty third right now. Um, they've got some real momentum and a chance to to really surprise some people. Obviously, their their schedule gets a lot more difficult down the stretch. They've got LSU still, Kentucky, South Carolina. I mean, they've got all the big hitters left. So, um, so long way to go, but some some pretty good early season momentum for Missouri if they can get this one and sitting in 5 and 0, oh, that's that's going to be a challenging game for for LSU to have to go in to facing a a solid Missouri team with a lot of momentum. Absolutely. Uh, I like Missouri plus thir- or minus 13 and a half. Uh, I think they dog walk Vandy this week. I really do. I think they're much better, much more prepared, and, and they're playing with high intensity right now. And it's hard, to, it's hard to be up for games when you're two and three early on. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I like them to get to five and oh, setting up a, a really interesting matchup with LSU next week. And obviously LSU's coming off of – you know, a couple really competitive games, more than likely, but you know, we expect the Ole Miss game to be close. So that that's kind of a, a sneaky, you know, tricky game there for LSU. And a road eleven o'clock game is always a tough one too. So I'm I'm keeping my eye on that as we as we go into next week. But mentioned earlier, Arkansas and Texas A and M. Want to see uh, Connor Wegman or Wegman? I can't. <laughs> I'm kind of confused on his pronunciation. Wegman, now, Wigman, but, Wigman. W- w- yeah, Wigman. But uh, I want to see what his health is going into this game. This game's in Jerry World in Dallas. So neutral site games always – I feel like this is always one that's super competitive too. It's always a, a really back-and-forth type of series. Um, it, was a, it was a really crazy game last year uh, that A&M ended up pulling out. So – Really curious to see this game, if Arkansas can kind of build on that momentum. Um, want to see if their offensive line two weeks in a row can really hold up. You know, we saw what the A&M front did this past weekend. But we also saw what, you know, Miami did to them. Not that, you know, not that Arkansas is going to be taking shots like Tyler Van Dyke did. But, um, you know, if, if Arkansas can, can give him time up front, there may be some plays – to be had that their their receivers really play well Saturday against LSU. Oh yeah, and I think that they're bought into the to the program. I know they have you know two losses. They're they're sitting at five hundred right now, but the the writing's on the wall, man. They can see that they they're they have a chance. They're in every game. They just got to fi- figure out how to close the deal, man. They they haven't closed the game out that that they're in in a close tight game here this season yet. But they can see that it can be done, man. They're they're right there at the end in every game. They just can't close it out. And I feel like this week, you know, especially coming off that that game last week, they played a really really good game against a really good opponent who everyone thought was two and a half touchdowns better than they were. So I think that they're going to come in fired up, and I I think that potentially they could upset uh, Texas A and M. 
And I really think that the players and the teams, they, they really love Sam Pittman. They're bought into what he's preaching, but they, they can see it for themselves. They, they can see, man, we just need to take that one more step forward and close out these games, and we'll be a really, really good football team and someone to be reckoned with. Uh, I, I think you can sense it for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just – it's crazy how close a lot of these teams are in the SEC. I mean, you know, a, a game that you thought was going to be – you know, not really that competitive. You look at LSU and Arkansas, how competitive that is. I mean, we've got a bunch of competitive games on the board this week. It's just there's so many teams in the SEC that it's just, you know, one play, you know, a couple plays here or there can make the difference in, in a game and a season, you know, can shake up the standings. I mean, it, it's crazy how competitive this conference is. I mean, like I said, there's so many of those, I call them, even some of the upper tier teams, but man, there is just so much parity and they're so close, you know, one through nine or 10. I mean, yeah, every, any given Saturday, you know, one of these teams can beat the other. That's, that's right. what makes it so fascinating to watch. I mean, so we, we got a bunch of really competitive games this week that wouldn't be surprised at all if you don't see some, some more surprising results this week. Absolutely. You got any bet picks you're really liking early on? I got a few, I think. Give, give me one set. I, I'll let you kind of go first if you got some on your mind. I've got a couple that I took early, none in the SEC, but a couple nationally. So if you've got any, go ahead and share if you'd like. Yeah, Friday night, Oregon State is a three-point favorite against Utah. They are hosting Utah. It's an 8 a.m. kick. Um. You know, Utah played a really low-scoring game against UCLA this past week, had a defensive touchdown, really was the difference in the game. They won 14-7. to You know, UCLA's no slouch. They're one of the better teams in the Pac-12. Utah's the defending Pac-12 champs. Oregon State just lost to Washington State this past weekend, came down to the wire. Or Washington State was up 10, could have kicked a field goal, won me some freaking money, decided to go for the, the touchdown, got turnover on downs. Oregon State ended up driving it back down the field punching it in and they end up losing by three. But I think Oregon or excuse me, I think Washington or Utah is going to beat Oregon State this weekend. Um Oregon State, like I said, is a three point favorite. I think Utah's a better team. I, I think, you know, Cam Rising's back. They're they're a more complete team. They've been through the ringer. You know, they've won the championship last year. They know what it takes to to get the job done and to fight to the last whistle. I think Utah upsets Oregon State this weekend. And I, so I would take Utah Plus three, and I would also take a money line if uh, if I'm betting tonight. Another yeah. game I like: Penn State's playing Northwestern. Penn State's been rolling, man. They've I believe they've covered in every single game this year. I think they're four and zero in covers. Uh, they're a twenty six point favorite. They just beat. Uh, I can't remember who they played this past weekend. They won thirty one nothing. Their defense is really good. Northwestern's five hundred team. Uh, you know they had some some commotion and some – they were in the headlines for some bad things right before the kick – right before kickoff this year. Um, I just – I don't think that they're a team that can be on the field with Penn State, and I think Penn State covers is 26. Yeah, I like those couple. I, I've got – I've got Nebraska uh, plus 18. They're hosting Michigan. I mean, don't think they're going to win this at all. I, I do think they, they keep it close with Michigan. I feel like – I don't know if Michigan's really – clicks offensively yet i mean i mean they have looked pretty good they had a nice win over rutgers i actually took rutgers plus the 24 and and luckily it was a if rutgers would have kicked a field goal away instead of going for it on four down out of cover but i did get a push so that was that was nice um so i like nebraska plus 18 uh san diego state i got plus 10 and a half against air force um so this couple I like so far. I'm I'm definitely looking hard at the South Carolina plus 12 and a half, especially if that goes up any further. I um, like that one. Um, and to, to be honest, I wouldn't – I'm keeping an eye on the Auburn-Georgia line because I, I would not be surprised if Auburn doesn't play them close, um, at least within the number, I think. I, I do think you'll see a better offensive performance from Auburn this week. Um, and like I said, I, I think – I don't know if Georgia's really clicked yet. As I mentioned earlier, I, I just I think Auburn's defense can can hang in there. Like if their offense can get 
anything going. If they could just get some points early, get the cr- keep the crowd in it, I think their defense can hang in there and, and keep them in the game at least, like I said, at least within the number. So I'm gonna keep an eye on that too. If any if any Georgia money comes in, that that line creeps up a little bit more. I'm I'm definitely that's one I'm considering. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't keep it in, within the number at least. And I also like Texas. Texas is hosting Kansas. Texas is a 17 point favorite. They were also a 17, 17 and a half wherever you were looking point favorite over Baylor this weekend. And absolutely throttled Baylor. Um, Texas is a force to be reckoned with. I believe they're going to be in the playoffs this year. Their offense is a high-powered offense, and they're able to put up points and put them up quick. Um, I don't think Kansas is going to be able to hang with them. Both undefeated. I see that, you know, 4-0. and But I, I like Texas to cover 17 here. I think they're going to win by 24 or more, if I'm being honest. And um, I have one more game here. USC – and Colorado. USC is a 21 and a half point favorite. It's 11 a.m. kick. I, I think USC and Oregon are the two best teams in the Pac 12. We just saw what Oregon did to uh, Colorado this past weekend. Now, I don't think USC's defense is near to the caliber of what Oregon's defense is. Uh, Oregon was also, man, Dan Lanning had them playing out of their minds. His pregame speech had me ready to run through a brick wall. Uh, he said some things there. I mean, y'all can go find it online. But my favorite thing he said was they're playing for clicks. We're playing for wins. Talk with your pads. Talk with your helmet, dude. I was ready to roll. I mean, that man had me fired up. Uh, I had I had Colorado plus 21. Didn't pan out. Um, I also think that on the flip side of that, Prime is not going to have back-to-back weeks of laying an egg. I, I think Colorado is going to be able to score some points on this USC defense. So I, I think this is going to be a high power game, a, a high scoring game. I would probably take the over. I'm not sure what the over is on, on this game right now, but if I was to if I was to take something in this game, I'm probably taking Colorado minus or plus twenty one and a half. I don't think they get blown out back to back weeks, and I think they keep it within the number of this USC team. I think that they lose this game, but I think that they're able to score on this US, US, uh, USC team, and, and I think they keep it within the number. Do you want to take a stab at what the over-under is? I would probably say 76 and a half. 73 and a half. So, you're wow. you're real close, yeah. That's so, unreal, dude. I mean, yeah. I just said the Oregon-Colorado game was – the over-under was set at 70. So, I can only imagine what this game is with absolutely no defense on USC side. So, I, I mean, 73 and a half, that's crazy, dude. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> well – I think you're right too, because I mean, you you got to think Colorado, after that offensive performance and getting dominated the way they did, much easier defense this time. They're back at home. It's off that kind of law, kind of an embarrassing loss, I guess mm-hmm. you know you'd say. So, um, yeah, I definitely think, and I don't have any confidence in Colorado's defense either. I think USC is going to hang a bunch on, but I, I think Colorado can hang a bunch on them and probably will. Um, you know, I read you that drive chart from Arizona State last week. Mm-hmm. Eight turnovers. One of the worst drive charts you'll ever lay your eyes on. That same team just put 28 on USC. Yeah, that that uh, USC just beat them 42 to 28. So, that that same that same bunch put twenty eight on USC after couldn't score against Air the week before. So, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean that, that the Air had four turnovers against them. So <laughs> I mean it was crazy. So yeah, I, I would not be shocked at all if Colorado doesn't hang a pretty good number. I just think unfortunately, USC will hang a bigger one, but wouldn't be shocked at all if it's within the twenty one and a half though. Absolutely. Uh, before we get out of here, what were your thoughts, man? Ohio State, Notre Dame. I had Notre Dame plus three. That pushed. I also had Notre Dame money line. Notre Dame had a chance to walk out of their victors, drop two interceptions on the last drive, and in the last two plays of the game, the most important plays of the game, they they only have ten guys on the field. Yeah. And then Marcus Freeman says in the post game, well, we didn't want a chance having a penalty run them out there. Dude, they're on the half-yard line. You can only get so close off of penalties that half of a half ain't much. You know what I mean? Like, they, they mm-hmm. weren't going to score off of your penalty. Get talk, Run someone out there. Call a penalty. Whatever you got to do or have a penalty call. Don't just go in there and just say, well, 
I hope our 10's better than their 11. I mean, good grief. Yeah. Absolute gut punch. I mean, they were winning for 58, 59 minutes and 58 seconds, and then end up losing it in the last two seconds because they don't got their head on straight, and they only got 10 guys out there. Now, now Ohio State may still have punched it in, but my God, dude, they ran to the weak side, obviously, because there's a less guy there. What mm-hmm. are we doing? I mean, how are you How are you not locked in the most important part of the game? How do you not see that from the booth, the play before or the pass play? How do you not see that and run a guy out there? Like, there is a guy there, – there's got to be a guy, y'all. I know that there is, counting every player on the field. That's not a ref. There's got to be a coach that's counting every player on the field to make sure you got 11 and not 12 or 10. Like, what, what in the world was going on? And I believe, too, one of the final two plays was after a timeout, I believe. Mm-hmm. if I, It may have been the part, the second-to-last play. Yeah, may have been they the took one, I believe. Yeah, so I, I they, I'm pretty positive they came in with 10 after the timeout, and then the final play, they still only had 10. So, yeah, crazy. I'm like, you. Yeah, I'd take the penalty and, I mean, let it ride because, like I said, I mean, they're on the one, so – Worst, worst half the distance to the goal. You're on the half yard line versus the, the one. I mean, it's still. I mean, either way, it's going to be hard to stop them. But I mean, right. you, you want eleven on eleven. I mean, I, I don't know. I, that's kind of, kind of crazy to me. But um, yeah, it was a great game though. Um, I'm really. I think, I think Notre Dame earned a lot of respect, and I still think that they're in the playoff hunt if they can win out. Yeah, I, I think. This is a really good Notre Dame team. You know, I mentioned with Ohio State, you know, in our earlier podcast, like, I mean, this isn't the same, at least not yet, this isn't the same offense you're used to seeing at Ohio State. But, their defense, like I said, it's dogs. It's almost an even better sign for them because, like I said, you, you would have anybody out there would have a lot more confidence in Ryan Day's staff to figure out the offensive side and catch that up rather than having your defense plan from behind or lagging behind, if you will. Like, you've got to have a lot more faith, especially with the talent they have on that offense. You've got to have a lot more faith in them. I think pretty much everybody would universally agree with that. Like, you have more faith in them figuring out that part of the, the team than their defense. Because their defense has struggled for years, now their defense is is legit. That was good. I mean, when is the last time Ohio State has scored seventeen and won a big game? I mean yeah. that that would never would have happened before. That was a great atmosphere. That's a really good Notre Dame team too. I mean, it, that was a that was a playoff level type of atmosphere, type of competition. So that was a lot of fun. Um, like I said, I just. You know, Ohio State, they made a couple plays there at the end. You know, Notre Dame, they had multiple chances to kind of slam the door shut, and they just they just do it. weren't quite able to do it. I mean, they, they dropped a pick or two. They dropped two picks on the last drive. You know, Kyle McCord, uh, give him credit, he really stepped up. I mean, it was a, it was a little shaky at times, but, you know, he made the plays. I, I thought the one throw he made down the seam, Mm-hmm. Right there at the end to get it to the the one or two yard line Martin there, Wilson, like he, yeah. he he fit that ball on the line like that was a, that was a high level throw. So, um, yeah, I mean overall, I think a lot of people are say things about Ohio State because it, it's different than what they're used to, but I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for them. I, mm-hmm. I think they're going to be just fine. Like I mean, if I'm if I'm them, just looking at it from no bias and outside observer, I'm I'm like, I, I I guess I feel even a little bit more dangerous playing them just because I know I'm going against a legit defense now, yeah. and and I figure by the by the stretch run of this season, their offense is probably going to be playing a lot lot better because we know what kind of weapons they have Ooh. at running back at receiver. I mean, so I I think they're going to be just fine. I hope we see another Notre Dame Ohio State matchup in the playoffs. I really do, because man, yeah. in my opinion, those are the two best teams in college football right now, hands down. That'd be yeah, it'd be a lot of fun, man. I, and and that's the thing. The rest of this year, it's gonna be crazy. There's so much parity. I mean, you could, and I think, I think too. Even as we get into October and November, I think you could look up November, and there could be 
10 or 12 legit playoff contenders. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's going to be – I do think this is the year we're going to get a two-loss team. I think it's very – because I think there's so much parity. I think teams beating up on each other. Would not be surprised at all if, if this isn't the year – Crazy, but the year before we go to 12, but I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if a two loss team doesn't make it in. So, oh, me either. So, it's, it's going to be it's gonna be fascinating to watch. We appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, we'll be back after week five. Like I said, a lot of intriguing matchups in the SEC and, and nationally again this week. So, we're we're locked in for the for the part of the season, and, and we appreciate Be sure to like and subscribe. and. And uh, we'll catch you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, guys.